Hello, everyone. Welcome. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, yeah. yeah? great. First of all, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, we'll spend the next 40 minutes or so. And I promise to get you out of here on time. I know Shabbos is coming in quick. Everybody has a lot to do. First, as we get started, I want to say thank you, Hashem. It's starting already. Uh, for the opportunity to stand here in front of you today and share my story, uh, one that's very deep and very personal and will become very raw at times, so just bear with me. I also want to say thank you to Gedalia and Avi for inviting me here today, and an even uh, more deep and special thank you to uh, Broken Ties, an uh, organization that's very special to me and has supported me through my journey over the last year, and uh, to my family sitting here. Thank you for being here to support me. Okay, here we go. So the topic I've been asked to speak about today is um, called From Suffering to Salvation. And it's really a glimpse into my story uh, with uh, the idea that it could be your child's story, right? We've all experienced so much trauma in our lives. Our children have experienced trauma. This is, seems to be the buzzword of the weekend. So I'd like to share with you um, how I saw life as a young guy and a teen and as an adult uh, suffering in silence. All right, not knowing how to speak out what I was experiencing. So, I hope you'll bear with me. My goal is not only to let you know who I am as I'm new to this community, um, but to also give you a uh, understanding of why maybe some ch of your children have made the choices that they've made. All right, maybe they didn't feel like they had very many. And uh, finally, at the very end, I want to give you a, a little bit of an idea on how you may be able to help and support your children in a, in a really great way, okay? Before I begin, I want you to stand up if you're a mother who dedicated her entire life to providing a loving home for your children. <laughs> stand up. And if you're a father, who so stand, stand up and stay standing, please. If you're a father who supported his family and gave them everything he thought that they needed, please stand up. And if you're not standing yet, and if you're a parent who did the best that they could and made some mistakes along the way, please stand up. Now that you're all standing, give yourselves a round of applause. A real round of applause. You can pat yourself on the back, all right? You all deserve it. You're amazing parents. And as you sit down, I want you to remember that your child's behavior is about them. It's not about you. In fact, I had great parents too. Really great parents. <clears throat> I'm one of three boys. I have an identical twin and a younger brother. We grew up in Northeast Philly in a row home. We all shared one bathroom. Some of you may know what that's like. I went to a great school, a Hebrew school, secular day school, and a Hebrew school at night on, on, on Sunday. I even went to Israel in uh, 96 on a beautiful youth trip. I went to a great college out in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and I was lucky and fortunate enough to get a lot of great jobs. In fact, I spent the majority of my adult career in sales and primarily in medical device sales, about 15 plus years, which was stressful, <laughs> very stressful. In fact, my entire life was about stress. I was one of these kids that was always seeming to be worried about everything, trying to figure out if I get this here and that there, it should work out. And it sometimes didn't, as you know, it, it sometimes didn't. I was, as a child, pretty happy. You know, I felt like we got what we needed. We had a great set of friends, a lot of people to hang out with, a lot of people to rely on. But I was always feeling inside turmoil, right? The kishkas, they tell me, were turning a lot. In fact, when I went to Israel, I came back, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease an intestinal disorder uh, that really affected all of my dietary uh, and eating habits, uh, which was also stressful, <laughs> carried that through college. So what was building as a stressful uh, childhood uh, compounded over time. I uh, was doing great in medical device sales, high performer, making great money. And um, I was fortunate enough to meet during a sales presentation um, my now ex-wife, but uh, we had a great couple of years together where we uh, had a lot of fun. 
and uh, we, uh, we started our life together. In doing that, uh, I realized that in the industry that I was in, this medical device sales industry, there was a lot of consolidation, meaning one company bought another company, bought another company, and every time one company bought another company, uh, the salespeople got sort of you know, chopped down, and they had to um, pick and choose who's going to stay and who's going to go. So I thought, I got an idea. I'll go and get a master's degree. And uh, in doing so, um, we also made the choice that we're going to have a little baby girl, who's now eight. <laughs> I told my daughter, actually, I said, I'm a little nervous about giving this talk. And I thought she would say something really profound. Instead, she said, suck it up, Dad. <laughs> um, so about uh, one week prior to Lexi being born, I um, entered into this master's degree program, which was every other weekend. I would come, we would study, and then I would go and live my life. I was a new dad, I was working in medical device sales, I was supporting you know, my family to the best of my ability, and uh, all the while I was suffering. I mean, really, really struggling. I, uh, at times, turned to drugs, some marijuana, I'm sure some of you in the room have experience with that or have heard uh, the stories of your children. I was looking for a coping mechanism. I was tired. I had a tough temper. I was angry and stressed. Did I mention that? I did really well in the master's degree. I got up early, 4 a.m. in the morning. I studied at night and uh, tried to be as mindful of a dad as I could possibly be. But I was in a total, total fog. When I finally got out of the master's program, I realized that um, I was out of control. I was so reactive to everybody's comments and statements. If they said something that I didn't like, I was you know, firing back at them and yelling and screaming all the time. And I felt like, wow, if they're hearing me scream outside, I wonder how I sound on the inside, like really, really struggling. Obviously, I was struggling to keep pace with everything, right? Financially, right? I was doing well the house and the cars and the vacations and the stuff, you know, it seems to pile up pretty quickly. And in doing so, uh, I was reactive and stressed, short-tempered. I really only had a desire for one thing, peace, calmness, happiness, right? Just to get the heart to stop beating so fast. I couldn't figure out how to do it. After finishing the master's degree, I hit a wall, a complete and under, utter wall. In fact, I, at the time, had almost everything that I, that I wanted. I had the great job, new marriage, beautiful baby, the money. But I wasn't yet satisfied. I wasn't able to really feel like I had enough. There was something out there I was yearning for. Because of my reactivity, lack of communication skills, which if you're interested, come to my workshop tomorrow after Shabbos, a little plug. I was reacting, reactionary to my, to my wife at the time, and uh, our relationship started to suffer from it. We didn't have the best role models, either one of us. We didn't know really how to respond. Traditional therapy didn't go so well for us. Uh, not that that's a bad thing, of course. And, um, I could see that the uh, writing on the wall at the end of the marriage was, was just about there. And um, this is about two months after the master's degree. After going to try to save my job, I was fired violently from the job. And um, my wife at the time left our marriage. And uh, I got sued by a neighbor getting into a verbal altercation in the street. He was driving his car a little too fast for my taste, and I let him know what I thought of that. I found myself alone, like completely and utterly alone. Everything that I had built and worked so hard to do just crashed in, in an instant. It just was gone. So I was left picking up the pieces. And everybody said to me, you need some help, Jason. I said, OK, I'm ready for the help. I remember scheduling the appointment with the chief, you know, the guy. 
of psychology at a local hospital. And after 35 minutes, he diagnosed me with a personality disorder, right? Which was quite odd, considering I didn't think I had one. And the symptoms also were indicative of somebody who was sort of spiritually awakening. Nonetheless, after 30 minutes or so, he prescribed uh, a pretty high-dose medication, which I had never heard of before, but after Googling, decided, it's not me. It's not for me. Now, growing up, I had spent years on anti-anxiety medications, the SSRIs, right? The ones that were supposed to get you even keeled and mellowed you out, the cocktail of medications. And I was self-regulating those, right? T tuning them up when I needed them, sending them down when I thought I was doing okay. But I came home after that prescription and I said, I'm done with this. And not only did I not fill that prescription, but I had taken myself off cold turkey, all the medication that I had been on for years. And that is not medically advised one bit, all right? I suffered greatly with withdrawal symptoms for like seven weeks. I'm embarrassed to say, but I was crawled up in a ball underneath a table in the living room. I couldn't get myself literally to stand up. Meanwhile, the house was quiet. My ex-wife now had moved out. And I was like, what am I gonna do? Everybody around me thinks that I'm angry and mean. I'm yelling and barking orders at them. If they got too close, I would bite their hand off. And uh, I was just totally, totally uh, dumbfounded. I didn't know what to do. I knew that I'd always been into um, yoga, meditation, fitness. And so I decided, all right, this is going to be my plan. I'm going to go downtown into Philadelphia and I'm going to get back into this. I'm going to take a yoga class. And I remember I had this favorite teacher and she wasn't there that day, as luck would have it. And as a result, there was another teacher there that offered at the end of this class, this yoga class, this guided meditation. And for the first time in so many years, I felt like I could actually breathe like sit in stillness and not have to do anything or react to anybody or anything. I didn't have to figure anything out. So I left that class and I thought, wow, like how can I actually implement this? Like how can I use this as my comeback, right? How can I use this to get strong both in my mind and in my body? And so I had done a little bit of meditation, but I wasn't really sure what it is. I don't think anybody actually knows. And if you're interested, you should come to my shear on Sunday, another plug. We'll talk a little bit about mindfulness and breathing techniques to slow down your heart rate. So I decided, let me just start. What if I just sit here for a few minutes and breathe and just see what happens? And I tracked on an app for 236 days consecutively. I think I missed a day or two after that. Uh, this practice. And in doing so, that little consistency, a few minutes every day, it started to make me feel different. I got stronger here and here and I was able to slowly begin to pick myself up, right? Just slowly, just get up and start moving again. I never went back into the industry, this medical device industry. It was too cutthroat for me and I had had enough. And so I decided that I would start a, my own startup company. I had a, medic, or a, a technology product and an app and I tried to you know, make them work. And for some reason, people decided that they wanted to give me money and so I collected about $150,000 in about a month's time of people I spoke to on the phone. And they wired me all of this money and I, well, I spent it pretty quickly, about nine months. And uh, business never took off, it just never worked. So I was like, well, what am I gonna do now? <laughs> you know, I'm like my third redo. I gotta rebuild again. So of course I picked myself up once again and I thought, well, if I'm gonna do this one more time, if I'm gonna make something of myself, what can I do? And I thought, you know what, this meditation thing, I think I know what I'm doing now. And I decided to borrow more money. You know who gives out money? Banks. They lent me a lot of money. And I spent it on building a beautiful community meditation center. It was the first of its kind in the Philadelphia area. It was called Sit Meditation Space. And it really gave people an opportunity to come together as a community uh, to lift each other up, to slow down, to go inwards, right? To get clear, gain clarity about what they really wanted out of their own lives and to support each other in doing so. And there was something like 
18 teachers and 35 different classes, all different types of meditation. It was spectacular. I spent all the bank's money building this beautiful studio space to make people feel really safe and secure, a feeling that I'd been searching for my entire life. Well, that was tough too. <laughs> As all of you know, retail business was tough. It was a new concept. I'm not sure that the public was ready for this idea. I was still going through the ending of the divorce. At one point I just said, you know, take the money. I don't want to fight anymore. And uh, I was left with nothing. And in doing that, I shut the studio down. Rebuild time. <laughs> I was getting good at it this time though. <laughs> Thank you. I'll give you the forewarning. This is going to hit me hard. I remember closing the studio after thinking, I have a choice here. I have to put food on my table for my daughter, or I could support a community of people coming together for love and kindness. We used to, um, Lexi and I, sell our furniture. I remember this beautiful girl said to me, Dad, sell the couch. And we did on that Facebook marketplace. I think we got like 70 bucks for it, but it was enough to make the rent. We lived in a one bedroom apartment at the time. We just gave everything away. But I remember the look in this little girl's face when she understood what true sacrifice was. And I realized that maybe I was making more of a difference than I thought I was. Maybe slowing down and listening and being together with my daughter and supporting her and what she wanted was more important than anything else. She sat in a bean bag. <laughs> she still has it in the corner of her room. I think it's a pride thing. But she sat on the bean bag for about a year. And so we were able to afford buying a new couch to sit on. We love that couch. It means a lot to us. So, I was so lucky. I got a phone call one day from a therapist. She was running a local practice. And she says, I'm working with people experiencing trauma. Wasn't really sure what trauma was. I didn't have a word for it. Now I know what trauma was and what it is. And she gave me an opportunity to be uh, sort of an adjunct off to the side. You know, can you help people slow down, go inwards, relax, breathe? so that they're able to do the heavy work that I was doing as a therapist. And I said, thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes, I will take it. And I did. It was in the beginning of um, 2020. And um, she gave me a little upstairs office. I made it nice. It was great. I think I had about four or five clients and I was flying high. And then COVID hit. <laughs> Reinvention time. So here I was thinking, what am I going to do? What can I do? What am I qualified to do? And I reminded myself that many people are struggling. Many people are suffering. I was suffering. And I used that pain and suffering to put myself back up. And what was really cool, and I didn't know at the time, I was documenting it along the way. I was trying to figure out, okay, like if it was something was gonna work, I wanted to make sure that whatever it was that I was doing was because I knew that I was doing it, right? I wanted to do deliberate actions. And I kind of tracked what was working, what wasn't working. And at that point, my experience was simply what I had done in my life. It was drawing from my sales experience, my successes, my failures, the things that worked in my life, the things that didn't. And so I decided that I would start a coaching business online because, well, everybody was on Zoom and you didn't really need much startup capital. Nobody wanted to lend me money at that point, I promise you that. And so I put a website out there and I called myself a mindset coach. Sounds pretty good. Life coach was taking, so. I started to take the process that I used to rebuild my own life, to go inwards, to gain clarity, right? To take action to move forward, to overcome your fear. And I tried it with one person. Kind of worked. I was like, okay. And then another person. Thank you. 
and then another, and then another. And I started to build my confidence. Like, maybe I actually have something here. Maybe I'm qualified to do this. Maybe I can build myself back up even better this time around. It's amazing how the emotion just comes up. You can feel it. Rabbi Russell was doing this. Who was in his, his talk last night. I love that. I'm going to start doing it. I remember getting a call from a psychiatrist, and she said, um, hey, would you be interested in joining a call with me? I work with a group that is suffering from the trauma of their children not speaking to them. I said, hmm, it's interesting. Now, I had gone through this not speaking to my parents thing a few times. During the divorce, my mother, I overheard, was in collaboration with my ex-wife, making comparisons to, of me to my father, uh, who she had divorced a year or so before that. I now know that that emotion was betrayal, at least from my perspective, and she saw it differently, clearly. And I'm sure that it was never her intention to betray me in any way, but we get wrapped up in things. My father and I had a tough relationship, and I estranged myself from him as well. I pushed them both away. And I thought, hmm, yeah, I can relate to this. So I remember jumping on this Zoom call one night with an organization called Broken Ties. <laughs> and thank you all for being here. Yeah. It's an incredible organization. Uh, that has built a support system and so much more for parents and grandparents suffering in a deep way. If you're here in the very beginning of my, my uh, introduction, what I've realized is, as parents, we give so much to our kids. We give them everything. And it's funny, because <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> I believe that all parents give their kids everything that they think that they need with the resources and tools that they have to do so. What nobody really told me about this Zoom call was that there are going to be 75 from Jews from Muncie, Lakewood, and Brooklyn, New York. Now, I didn't mention earlier that I grew up Jewish, conservative. I told you I went to Israel. I went to secular like a day school, or a, like a Hebrew school. But, I don't know, I had a bar mitzvah, a b'nai mitzvah, and a snowstorm, blizzard of 93, if anybody remembers that. <laughs> but I never really did anything. I think I put the fill on one time. And I'm thinking, what am I going to say to religious Jews? Like, what am I, what kind of credibility, what kind of street cred do I have uh, giving over advice, you know, to them? And so I sat and I listened, and I listened some more. And uh, I think I went from like a short sleeve polo shirt the first session to a longer sleeve, you know, dress shirt. I got the clue real quickly where I should, should put myself. And um, one by one, I was getting phone calls from these amazing women saying, can you help me? And my natural response was, with what? <laughs> And they said, well, we like what you're saying. We think that, um, you know, maybe I need to feel stronger in my mind, in my body, so I could do the really tough work of trying to reconnect with my child. And I think we'll talk about this a little bit more through the weekend. And these are really tough situations because when a child is alienated from their parent, there's usually an alienator. There's a third party or a perpetrator that's creating a delusion. Is that a fair word? Or an illusion that the parents love and kindness uh, somehow done out of manipulation and control. When in reality, uh, it's the alienator who is searching for the control. And this could be anybody. It could be a, a rabbi, a rav, a rabbitson, a rosh, a shiva, a therapist. Did I call everybody out? Okay. <laughs> With respect. What's that? Thank you, yeah. So I said, okay. Sure, let's work together. And we were doing these private sessions. Funny thing was, every time I did 
like these sessions that I was giving over a little tool or a little technique, something that worked, I would hear the same thing over and over again. They said, how do you know this information? I said, who are you talking to? What do you mean, how do I know? They said, no, 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 that's not what we mean. Right? I said, well, what do you mean? They said, no, how do you know this information? I said, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, the Torah says things like this. I said, what Torah? Whose Torah says this? I, I never read a Torah. I'm just, you know, just a guy who's had a really, you know, tough upbringing. And so they, I said, okay, you've convinced me. It's in the Torah. Show me. And that's when they said, well, we, we, we can't show you. I said, what? See, it doesn't exist. And they said, no, 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 you need a rabbi to show you. I said, okay, show me the rabbi. And so as huh, Hashem's masterful plan <laughs> would have it. <laughs> I met not only the rabbi uh, who would guide me, uh, but the fatherly figure that I was always sort of searching for. And this was uh, Rabbi Israel Monk out of Lakewood, New Jersey. And I remember calling Rabbi Monk after the recommendation was given to me. And he said, um, I said, hi, Rabbi. My name is Jason from Philadelphia. I'm not really sure what I'm calling you about, but I'm calling you. I remember exactly what he said to me. He says, great. I got one question. OK, Rabbi, one question. I could probably answer it. What's your address? My address? Yeah, what's your address? So I said, OK, it's an easy answer. So I gave him over the address, and he says, OK, I have to go, but let's talk next week on Monday, 1 o'clock. Two days later, I received a package in the mail. Inside, two books. One, a kumash. And two, a book on Bahira by Dr. David Lieberman. I'm sure most of you know him. And if not, I'm sure Torah Anytime will make the links accordingly. <laughs> He's the top speaker. So I met Rabbi Monk a week later. And I said, OK, now what? He says, page one. And we began to read together. And I only had the sole purpose of being able to support a community of religious people who I had never really been in or around. And in doing so, I fell in love. <laughs> Thank you. And over the last year, it's been quite a journey. A lot of you know me from that first, that first Zoom call. And uh, slowly but surely, I've been studying and learning and studying some more. And I stand in front of you today. Pretty religious, right? I mean. <laughs> I know that I give a lot. I know I do. I put my blood, sweat, and tears, my heart, my soul into everything that I do. I try to come from an authentic, humble place. But I never really imagined what I would receive back from this community. It's been overwhelming. It's overwhelmed my eight-year-old. I like to say she's the youngest Baltuva by choice. And to see the wonder through her eyes. Her love for Hashem. <laughs> she tells me, Dad, I want a snack. Not so much a mizonos, more like a shako. <laughs> <laughs> this little girl has become a surrogate for a lot of women experiencing parental or grandparental alienation. She's been a source of light. And it has really taught me that I have no idea what I'm doing as a parent. And so the best thing that you can do is be there with them. In a couple of moments as I wrap up, I see the time's going fast. I'll give you a couple of things that I think that I've learned, not so much as a parent, because I'm not the expert, but as somebody who became mindful and really aware of how this whole thing goes down. Let me summarize for you before I make my final points. Is this over at 3.30? 
I struggled a lot through stress, anxiety, depression. I struggled to express myself. I didn't have the tools. At times I felt nobody cares. Nobody sees me. I could hide. I could hide away. I could smoke it away. I could do whatever I needed to do. Nobody knew. On the outside, I was calm and steady, top for performer, top guy in the business competition, startup, you know, all of the stuff. But on the inside, I was dying. And I was really struggling. So in looking back, here's a few things that I learned. One, I didn't ask for help. I didn't know how. I didn't express my feelings. I didn't know how. In fact, I was a product of my own fight or flight. Right? You'll hear so much about this weekend. I didn't share my pain because I didn't know how. So I kept it bottled up until it came out and I reverted to my learned behaviors, like anger. I didn't let my parents in. I pushed them away. Because I didn't know how. And so I suffered alone. Every child, I don't care what the experts say, every child experiences trauma. Everybody in this room has experienced trauma. Emotional trauma, physical trauma. Here's my advice to you, unsolicited of course. I said this earlier, I wanna make sure I repeat it again so everybody hears it who missed it in the beginning. You must realize that no matter what your child is going through, whether they've estranged themselves or alienated or been alienated from you, whether they're off the derech, whether they're experiencing drugs, or they're on the internet doing something that's not safe. This is about them. It's not about you. And so number two, I'm asking you to show them compassion. I guarantee you'll hear many definitions of compassion, and I'll reiterate this over the next two days as well. Here's my definition. Compassion is the ability to sit in a room with someone, listening to how they feel, here's the key, without trying to fix it for them, okay? Without trying to fix it for them. And as parents, it's the thing we want. We want to remove their pain. You can't. They are here to have their own experiences. And that's number three. If they're here to have their own experiences, then your only job is to try to understand what their experience is and to be there with them. Empower them. That's number four. With tools. Because I didn't have them, you don't have them. And it's so amazing to see all of the great speakers this weekend. They're giving tools. Take them with you, apply them, practice them, learn them. By learning them and showing your children, you are teaching them. And you're also teaching their children and their children, and you get to redesign those learned behaviors. Validate them. If I had a quarter for every time I heard the word validation, I'd never have to work a day again, you know? <laughs> I'm gonna give you my definition of validation. It's to let somebody know that you heard what they said, but from the way that they intended for it to be heard. And I hope you'll join me tomorrow night. It's my second plug for my communications workshop where we're gonna talk about how to validate somebody and better understand what they mean by what they say. Everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants to be heard. It's the best that you can do for your children and loved ones is to see them, not for the way that you want to see them, but for the way that they want to be seen. Number six is give them some space. Breathing room, they need it. 
give it to them. All right. By being strong, by putting your own mask on first, by taking your own space and giving others space, everybody's fight or flight goes down, right? Uh, Rabbi Russell was saying, uh, what was the term he used? Going offline and then back online? Everybody needs to be online for you to co-create a strong, healthy relationship. And as I finish, I think this is number eight and probably the most important one yet. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. First of yourself, my definition of forgiveness, right? Realizing that you did the best that you could with the information that you had at the time. I'm sure if some of us had different information, we would have done different things. If we realized how our divorce uh, or our, you know, whatever, late nights at the office were influencing and affecting our kids and our family, we would have made different decisions. We, we weren't aware. It's not our fault. So it's not about placing blame. It's about being able to stand up and keep moving forward. And forgiving them for the pain that they've inflicted, either intentionally or unintentionally. For they did the best that they could with the information or lack thereof that they had at the time. My wish, one day I'll have rabbi in front of my name, I think, but for now, if I was to give a little wish, a little blessing, is that you take this story of mine and make it yours. Just fill in the details. And I hope that you're able to use it as something that can give you hope. <coughs> Hashem is perfect in everything he does. That's what I'm learning. And when you embrace that, the Tolkien, they tell me, when you really embrace this, there's something that we could all learn about ourselves and each other from all of this. My story is just one of many children struggling through trauma. Your kid will pull through. They need your support. They need your guidance. They need to see a great example from you. I'm asking you to stay strong for yourself and for each other. Find it in your heart to know that when they come back to you, when they come back to your guidance, and they will, that together you will grow into a, a healthy, strong relationship with boundaries. <laughs> and everything will be as it should be. Thank you so much for listening to my story. I really am grateful to all of you. And have an amazing Shabbos. And we'll see you soon. Thanks.